Welcome everyone to today's stream. It's One More Epoch Live. And today it's a special episode. It's called The Tiny Melt Device That Knows Smell. And I mean, in a few minutes, you'll know everything about it. And I'm, I'm so lucky today to be here with uh, my awesome co-host, Artie. The pleasure's welcome. all mine. The pleasure's all mine, Alessandro. I've been following your live streams for the past you know, year or two. So this is an honor and it's, you know, it's great to be my first live stream with, you know, such a professional. So everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, for those that don't know me, Artie Beavis, VP of Marketing at Edge Impulse. Edge Impulse, one of our core values is the community. And as you can tell by our social media presence and everything we do, um, it's at the heart of everything. So I think being able to bring everybody into this one form is a really exciting opportunity. Over the last few months, I've really been fascinated by everything everybody's been doing. And in particular, uh, one of the very first projects that I had stumbled upon was the uh, this handheld device that was able to identify smells by what's in the air. And this is just a testament as to what embedded machine learning is all about and the magic behind it all. The ability to give ordinarily dumb devices the capability to hear, see, and feel the world around them. And one other sense that has really started to emerge was the ability to sniff out different smells in the air. And that's a great segue into today's guest, Benjamin Kabe of Microsoft. He is the jack of all trades, but the principal program manager of Azure IoT. And uh, we're going to be welcoming him along with another special guest, Paul DiCarlo, principal cloud advocate and manager for IoT advocacy at Microsoft. So welcome, guys. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Yes, also, guys, it's wanna... a pleasure. Alessandro, you... sorry about that. That's right. No, uh, one thing I wanted to say before we get started, I mean, Artie, you said that I'm a professional. I'm no, nowhere near being a professional. I mean, you know, you never, you're never a professional when it comes to like doing things live, right? It's, it's actually, it's, it's always challenging. You know, you always get things. Actually, today you're having a, a, a storm right on top of your head, right, Artie? Yeah, so Tropical L says, you can see I'm all frantic. I'm like watching the lights flicker on and off. So <laughs> if things go black, that's exactly what happened. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, you can't change the elements of live streams. So we do have a tropical storm warning. So if something does happen, that's, you know, that's the reason. The beauty of live. But one, one other thing I wanted to say is I wanted to cheers to uh, my, my great friend, Robert Wolf at Innovation Coffee at Arm, because that's how we started. That's, that's how everything started. Uh, a year ago, I did uh, I, I did my first live stream, and after that, I did a year of live streams every every week. Uh, so that was exciting, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have been here without uh, without Robert and without all the support from from the Arm team. So um, I just wanted to say that before we get started with this new stream. So guys, it's amazing to have you on the show, and uh, um, today we have a couple of announcements that we'll start with, and then we'll introduce yourselves, and uh, we'll give you a chance to like talk about what you're doing today. Um, okay, so the first announcement is the big announcement that we we have here and the reason why we have Paul actually. Uh, so we actually have July OT happening right, right now, right? Paul, do you wanna say a couple of things real quick and then we'll dive deeper in July OT in a second, but just what it is and how people can actually get all the information. That's right. So July OT is really uh, 31 days of IoT content for everyone that we host over at the IoT tech community, which you can find the link to where we're making all these announcements and showcasing projects that fall in line with July OT at aka.ms slash July OT. And we'll talk about that a bit more in detail as we get further on into the stream. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. And then we've got a big announcement uh, today. We're actually, because this is the first live stream, and as Artie said, we want to celebrate the community. We actually have a giveaway. So Artie, do you want to say any a few words about that? Yeah, so you're going to see in a few minutes, uh, the heart of what Benjamin's project is all about is the we are, Seed Studio We Are Terminal. And to celebrate today's show, we're going to be giving away, or Seed Studio is going to be giving away three devices um, to lucky viewers who share the link in the comment section below um tagging seed studio on twitter so please do that spread the word get more people involved and you have a chance of receiving one of the three kits from our friends at seed cool so what you have to do is share the the link to the live stream that the one that you see in the chat now 
and tag Seed Studio, and uh, you'll have a chance to, to win one of the Wii Terminals. Awesome. And then before we dive into today's show, one last announcement. We've just announced yesterday, actually, our big yearly event, and it's called Edge Impulse Imagine. And here is the link to the website. And this is going to be a three-day event in September where you have a chance to like learn everything about Embedded ML. Uh, we'll have some really interesting guests. And we actually, we've got one confirmed guest online today. Benjamin, you'll, you're actually going to be one of, uh, one of the workshop speakers or presenters, right? I don't know. You, you're telling, you're running the program, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, um, Surprise. yeah, I'd love that. I think there's a, a ton to share about, um, like, I guess the way I've applied TinyML in the context of, uh, well, the project that we're going to talk about today, and in, and I guess also in the context of IoT, right? It's not not a surprise that we are talking today in the context of dual IoT, because at the end of the day, embedded machine learning and IoT are quite complementary, right? Absolutely. And, and that's why it's great to have you both here, because today we're going to talk about, especially, Benjamin, your project, but also how, you know, how it comes, uh, how it actually combines with, with the IoT, right? Because uh, we talk a lot about embedded ML. We, you know, a lot, one, of, one of the things that like, people say is, you know, embedded ML is about uh, really battery powered devices that are not connected because that you burn a lot of power when you connect uh, to the cloud and so on. But actually, there's a lot of use cases where it is important to be connected, right? Maybe you're not connected all the time, but you're connected sometimes. So today we'll talk about that, right? Like when does it make sense to be connected? Um, so with that, I'm really, I really want to welcome you guys and, and have, give you a chance to introduce yourselves. So maybe we can start with uh, Benjamin and then Paul right after that. Sure. So uh, yeah, my name is Benjamin Cabe. And so for those who don't know me, I've been, I guess, doing IoT for, for a long time and uh, open source as well. Like I've been with Microsoft for uh, for a couple of years, but b before Microsoft, I was already involved with uh, all sorts of open source and open hardware communities gravitating around um, things like the MQTT protocol and uh, like all things open source and, and IoT. And uh, at, at Microsoft, I'm part of the Azure IoT uh, product team. And uh, while my colleagues, they work on actually like building new features for uh, our suite of, of tools and, and frameworks for uh, for IoT, I'm more uh, one, one of the interfaces, I guess, with uh, third party communities and developer communities. That's, that's you. Uh, and so, yeah, when, whenever it comes to using open and hardware, uh, embedded AI, um, like uh, yeah, anything uh, like that. I'm essentially like working on on creating those bridges with the community, creating demos, tutorials, trying to identify new um, new use cases, new uh, potentially open source projects that, that that can be quite complementary with uh, with what we do um, at uh, at Microsoft for for IoT. Awesome. And Paul, take it away. So I've been uh, working with Microsoft for about almost eight and a half years now, primarily in developer relations style roles, which over the last uh, almost five years or so have really focused primarily in the Internet of Things space, which I always thought was an, an interesting thing to just, just to get into. Um, just thinking back to how I started, I remember I was, I was tasked to do something in the realm of hardware programming and thought to myself, uh, that's, that's hard. It's in the name. But uh, as you've probably realized over years, uh, these things have actually gotten a lot more accessible just in terms of the, the types of devices that are out there, the simplicity of some of the platforms and programming tools that are available. And you're starting to see that, I mean, even, even with what Edge Impulse does, where it's, you know, you're taking the artificial intelligence, which often is seen as being at the very high end of the totem pole in terms of things that are difficult to get into and making that not only accessible, but deliverable to very, very small devices that are on hand, easy to program. And these are the types of things that we within developer relations really see as being highly, I guess, uh, high potential in terms of changing the world around us. When you think about IoT at edge type of scenarios, bringing AI to the masses and making mainstream style products that leverage those technologies underneath the hood, we really see these types of things as being paramount to bringing that around. And, that's really where a majority of our work lies is finding developers, interested parties 
uh, folks who are building actual solutions in that domain and helping them not only build their solutions, but sometimes tell their stories. Totally. And you know, on that topic, um, being July OT week, um, I mean, July OT month with Edge AI week, um, what are some of the cool projects that you came about um, from the community that have really caught your attention aside from Benjamin's nose? Sure, sure. So there's been some really interesting stuff. And I think uh, before we sort of jump into that, I'll kind of give a brief overview of what exactly is July OT. Um, so as I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, you could kind of see here in the, the long running posts that we have here on the tech community, it is 31 days of content that we essentially think is for everyone. So if you head to aka.ms slash July OT, you'll see this long running post where every week we sort of focus on a specific theme, if you will. So this week, of course, being artificial intelligence at the edge. Next week being beginners, students, teachers, and makers, followed up by microcontrollers and embedded hardware and ending with online learning and certification. And the reason we sort of structured it that way is we can sort of introduce folks to a variety of different styles of looking at IoT, whether you're a beginner, whether you're someone who's a professional developer, and giving you that pathway to take it where you want to take it and hopefully be inspired to create your own thing. So looking at some of these projects here, uh, a few that we've seen that came out at the beginning of the month are things like the retro game translation tablet. So this was a project uh, was recently featured on uh, Scott Hanselman's Azure Friday that uh, can translate really any video game uh, to any target language. And it sort of does this in real time. Uh, it sort of takes a snapshot and then sort of in places within the textual area, translations of that. So that's kind of cool. Also, a lot of projects that focus on the Azure Percept development kit. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a new hardware offering from Microsoft that sort of allows you to make sense of the real world, utilizing onboard sensors for doing things like computer vision, as well as an audio sensor so you can make sense of sound. And so we've seen some interesting projects here, one that is a um, Azure Percept obstacle avoidance car. So this actually uh, uses the Percept in conjunction with Lego Boost uh, toys, off the shelf toys essentially, to create this autonomous vehicle utilizing those sensors on the device. Um, also, we've just had a lot of fun partnering with some of our uh, partner companies. Uh, yesterday was NVIDIA who came out for showcasing. Uh, we did an actual workshop where we had some remotely accessible NVIDIA devices that people logged into and completed some work for certification. But on top of that, you'll also see they've published a new article here that shows utilizing their transfer learning toolkit, which is really awesome if you're into uh, taking existing models and sort of enhancing those using services in the Azure cloud, you can do that. And uh, that gets us to where we are today. Uh, however, uh, where we're going and where what I'd like to hopefully excite everyone about for next week is the IoT for Beginners project. And this is coming from our academic IoT evangelist extraordinaire, Mr. Jim Bennett, who has created this gigantic 24 lesson, 12 week curriculum focused on teaching IoT to beginners. And this is really awesome, it, whether you're someone who hasn't tried IoT, maybe you teach a course, you're looking for curriculum content, and it doesn't stop here. They're already doing work to translate this to numerous different languages to make this accessible to cultures across the world. It is fully open source, and it is something that if you just wanna check out, you know, either for something that you'd like to get involved with yourself uh, or even contribute to, to make it even better than it is today, uh, those are all possibilities. So that's going to be a really big focus throughout uh, the following week within July OT. And of course, you'll want to stay tuned. Every Thursday, we will update the aka.ms slash July OT posting page with the latest and greatest offerings from July OT. It seems like we got a couple of fans of, uh, of Jim on the on the show, uh, so it's, uh, it seems like there's some ex you know people looking excited about about the about next week. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that's awesome. Please, uh, for folks who do know Jim, we'd love if you could help us spread the word. Um, one other thing I think that's important to note here too: we have a series of reactor live streams that are being uh, shared in conjunction with July OT. So these are topics focused on IoT where we are live streaming with the community. And again, you can find the links to all of these on that aka.ms 
slash July OT page. And we're seeing a lot of inspired content come out. And I want to tell everybody on this call, if you have an idea and it just happens to fit into IOT, it doesn't even have to fit the themed week. If you go ahead and tag that content with hashtag July OT, share it with us on social media, we can get in touch with you, possibly get your content published to the IOT Tech Community blog. As you've seen here, there's at least, and I just know this from the folks that I work with, uh, seven or eight articles that we've had come out just this week from folks that were inspired by this content. And we've even had students come through with content that, uh, you know, that actually promotes July OT from their own student projects that they're working on, uh, building promotional content and that sort of thing. So don't think you cannot get involved. This is not just for us. Remember, July OT is 31 days of IOT content for everyone. So please get involved if you're interested and find us on Twitter if you'd like to chat about your ideas. And speaking of that blog, a shameless uh, shameless post, but uh, we're going to actually be sharing an article of our own in the next uh, week or two. So stay on the lookout for that as well. Cool. And what was the best project of the week? Um, not to put you on the spot, Paul, but uh, I mean, we've got, you have to say it. I mean, now that, you know, before we said without mentioning Benjamin, right? But, you know, with, with Benjamin in the loop, which one was the best project of the week? <laughs> The best project of the week that I've seen so far, one that just kind of came out of the blue, I would have to say is this using Azure Percept to build an aircraft part checker. And the reason why I say this is that it took the features and functionalities of the Azure Percept dev kit's ability to spot anomalies with, with uh, computer vision and really turn this into something that solves a real problem. And I think bonus points because the author of this article is a pilot who is building an airplane, who is using AI to ensure that the airplane that he is building has the proper parts and that everything is co is sound there. So um, you, you can't really ask for that much more in terms of you know relevance when you, when you think of an article or a project. And so this really surprised us that something of this magnitude could come out in a week. And I won't be surprised to see someone top this next week. So please stay mm -hmm. tuned. Uh, with, with your ideas and let us know what you have coming along to share for July OT. Awesome. Very cool. Cool. So, so I guess, uh, yeah, I was going to say, so without further ado, I think this is a good chance to uh, bring in one of the man of the hour, uh, Benjamin himself, to kind of, you know, fill us in on his project and, you know, dive a little bit deeper into what makes the electric knows what it is. Yeah, sounds good. So, where should we start? So let's start from let's start from uh, how this uh, idea came about, right? Like, I know that you've talked about this plenty, so uh, you know, perhaps like let's keep it short. But you know, it's interesting why you started this, right? Like how it actually came to mind, right? Like why adding uh, smell to a device, right? Like what brought you to that idea? Yeah, um, well, a few things. One is um, I've been wanting or and or needing to learn AI for, for many years, like for some reason, um, AI neural networks, uh, it was like pretty um, weird beast for, for my brain, at least. Like I couldn't get my head around the, the sort of the hello world uh, of, of AI out there. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and there's like me being, I guess, an IoT and an embedded device kind of person um, stuck at home at the beginning of the, the pandemic where um, I was trying to perfect my bread recipe, right? Like probably many other folks, except that I've been actually trying to do that for the past couple decades and like yeah being stuck at home it was a one more excuse i guess and um i wanted to to see whether uh, like especially in the context of um bread made using uh, sourdough right uh trying to figure out whether some kind of device could help me smell uh, or identify the characteristics of what makes um, sourdough ripe and and perfect right so trying to sort of again smell the the sourdough and correlate that particular smell with or that's the fingerprint i guess olfactory fingerprint with uh, the quality of the bread and uh, this is where i had kind of the intuition i guess that i could use um, ai and um yeah and i guess it would it would start also with the sensor right and there's been um I, People might not know that people, 
if you, you, you watching us today or like just in general, when we think about sensors, uh, things that come to mind like temperature, humidity, um, uh, luminosity, all, all those kind of sensors, like they, they seem pretty common. Even like things like maybe smoke, right? Because we all have smoke detectors at home, hopefully. Uh, but there's more, right? And there are sensors that can smell and sense, measure the concentration of particular chemical compounds in the air. And uh, there are such sensors that you can get off the shelf for just like a, um, maybe like 20, 20, $30, sometimes less. Uh, and they, those sensors, they can pick up alcohol, they can pick up carbon monoxide and things like that. And I was like, hey, if I use one such sensor and somehow feed uh, the sensor data into an AI model, maybe I can achieve my, my, my goal and, and, and uh, at least work on my idea. So that's how it started about, about a year ago. That's awesome. And, you know, you mentioned that, and uh, we talked about it yesterday, actually, the fact that a lot of people think about, you know, machine learning and they think about vision or, or um, you know, other types of uh, kind of, usually it's audio and, and, uh, and cameras, right? But actually, sensors are, you know, there's a lot of different sensors out there. And it's really interesting because you can actually do machine learning using input from all these different sensors, right? And your application is super interesting because it does use a different type of sensors from the typical ones that we see around. Um, so that's super cool. Thank you for, for sharing that. And um, I guess, you know, the next step, you talked about the sensor. Uh, the next step above that then is, you know, how did you build your software? How, what were, what were the steps? You, you mentioned that, you know, you kind of use this project to learn about machine learning as well, right? So can you walk us through the steps that you went through and that, you know, you advise mm -hmm. perhaps people to go through? Yeah. Yeah, well, so the, like, the idea or the, the intuition was really to, to try and figure out, hopefully with the help of AI and machine learning, are there some uh, patterns um, and some like uh, characteristics of the, the, um, the sensor data that are like effectively what identifies the, the smell of good sourdough starter. Well, and by the way, I, I ended up um, like sort of pivoting and uh, I realized that rather than just limiting myself to sourdough starter, um, I could maybe try and classify and identify all sorts of smells. So what makes uh, coffee smell like coffee? And the way I started with the, the sensor, uh, so the, the sensor looks something, something like, like this, by the way. Right. So that's the one I use. It's from Seed 2, just like the, the, the device that we are, uh, they are giving away today. Um, so it's, um, yeah, this is a gas sensor. And typically when you want to manipulate such a, um, a sensor, again, super affordable, uh, very easy to get from Seed and, and many other uh, shops out there. Uh, usually you hook it up to, um, to some kind of embedded platform like an Arduino. I, Andrea, I know that you're, you're, you're watching us today, but uh, that's, I mean, that's how you do it. And that's how uh, that, that actually plays a huge role in uh, making uh, things very tangible and very easy to experiment with. And so you get the sensor and you start with whatever sample um, uh, library, sample application comes with it, right? And so for a, a temperature sensor, when you start tinkering with it, with your um, uh, Arduino um, programming environment, you like have sort of the hello world of a temperature sensor, which is displaying the temperature. Similarly, when you get uh, the gas sensor from Seed, the sample application is something which I guess I can actually show because uh, the um, some people might not know uh, but the folks at Seed, that my um, uh, like the final version of my project, the, most of the the UI is effectively like you can still see the initial um, sample that I used, right? And so this uh, so this is the Wii terminal. This is the device that we're giving away today, and the first like piece of software that I put there was very similar to this, except that it wouldn't show obviously what it is smelling, but it would show on a, a chart the um, the amount of gases that it's picking up, right? It's picking up X 
ppm of uh, volatile organic compounds, x ppm of NO2. And if I were to um, to play with the sensor and yeah, what can I do? I can try and put it, I have coffee right here. Let's try and, sorry, I hope you don't get motion uh, and seasickness, but yeah, I'm, this, the sensor right now is like diving into the, um, sorry, yeah, there we go. Uh, is like right in the coffee can. And I mean, sensor data is fluctuating. And so that was the, the beginning of my um, experimentation, making sure that for um, at least visually, I guess, for, um, for coffee, for whiskey, for uh, whatever booze I had around uh, back then, making sure that at least it would graph properly, right? And register properly in um, in the software. And it did. And so next step, and this is where I I could use some help and I did use some help uh, from uh, from the Edge Impulse tool suite in particular. Like I knew that I could collect data and, and sample some, uh, some data coming from my sensors, uh, but I would need to like capture data corresponding to a wide variety of smells and um, label the data, right? And I, I had a few books that I tried to um, to go through over the years to 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 learn about um, machine learning and so on. And yes, I could have like digged those books and and try um, like use some Python notebooks and try and figure out how I could uh, take my sensor data from uh, from the Wii terminal device somehow. Um, like take the data and put it in some kind of maybe CSV file, right? Or in an Excel spreadsheet, uh, and then uh, feed that into a, a neural network and, and, and train a model. But there's yeah tons of missing steps there, especially when you think embedded. Uh, this idea of offloading the sensor data that you get from, like that's flowing through the device and making this data uh, accessible to your AI training environment like, how do you do that? Like, do you put an SD card into the Wii terminal device? Do you like use some kind of um, communication protocol between your desktop computer and your embedded device? It's it's not necessarily easy, right? And so this is where I um, where I used Edge Impulse, I guess, right? But the, uh, long story short, because um, part of your question was trying to share some some tips. Whatever sensor you find out there, and there's literally um, hundreds of sensors, right? I mean, temperature, humidity, luminosity are like maybe the easy ones, uh, but you have color sensors, you have all sorts of uh, uh, cameras, obviously, uh, pressure sensors, uh, all sorts of gas sensors and uh, flex sensors, sensors that you would like stick to your, um, to your elbow and it would pick up how much you're, uh, you're flexing your, your arm, things like that. All those sensors, they come with sample libraries. Start with that, have a look. At least that's how my brain is wired and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same for, for many of you folks. Uh, have a look at the data and um, and like start there, right? Try and use your own brain to identify maybe some patterns. And then next step, I guess, is to use uh, tools like, like Edge Impulse, right? Thank you for that. That's an awesome answer. And I, I, you know, diving in a bit more on the on the machine learning side, given that this is about embedded machine learning, and then we'll talk about the IoT side that I'm also very interested in. Um, you know, can you can you maybe share shed a bit of light on the process that you went through to actually develop a, a machine learning pipeline? You know, going from you talked already a little bit about it, but going from like the acquiring data to actually um, you know architecting the whole uh, ML. Uh, the, the neural network, but also the DSP front end, right? Like, what choices did you have to make, and how hard was it to make those choices? Yeah. Um, so you know what? I think. So give me just a, a second, and I think I will. Uh, I will share my screen, and I will try and make um, uh, use maybe my um, my my edge impulse environment as as a support, right? So yeah, feel free to uh, uh, to to bring that up. So you're up. Yep. Uh, so a um, so I had sensor data flowing into my my Wii terminal device. I needed to sort of bridge that gap between sensor data is available on my embedded device, but I need to 
feed it somehow into whatever is going to be my uh, machine learning pipeline. And uh, the going down the road of using uh, Python and like setting up a TensorFlow, whatever environment on my uh, machine, like I could have probably done that, but I, I really didn't know where to start. Plus, uh, Back in May last year, uh, I had started to play a bit with with Edge Impulse and with the, with the tools you had available back then, and I knew that this would help me. And so, effectively, the first step is that I could um, I could use the um, um, a um, a tool that you guys provide, which allows to um, to easily bridge an embedded device connected to your uh, computer to the Edge Impulse uh, Studio, the Edge Impulse Tool Suite running in the cloud, right? And so for that, uh, it's like, it's pretty straightforward to, to, to implement. And if I were to um, to, to show you um, today how that works, um, I can like, my Wii terminal device is, uh, is plugged in right now. And I will just launch the particular daemon on my um, PC to, Essentially, bridge again the 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 Wii terminal, the the um, uh, this like embedded device that's acquiring sensor data, and to make sure that like remotely uh, it like I have virtually tethered the output of my sensor data like straight into my project in Edge Impulse, and so what that means is that even before thinking and like we we like thinking about like the the first few hours of the project back in May last year even without having started to think about how the neural network could look like, and that was still scary when I was getting started, I could already start acquiring data, acquiring and labeling data. So uh, what is my sensor doing right now? It's just sitting idle. It's not in the coffee I can anymore. So I'm going to just say that I'm going to capture, and this is this is live, right? Um, I should... Um, uh, remove the, the taskbar at some point, but let's um, yeah, let's just acquire, let's say what, three seconds of sensor data. And so remotely, the uh, Edge Impulse, uh, my Edge Impulse project in, is instructing my computer to take three, th three seconds worth of data from the, uh, the Wii or terminal. And it looks like that. And that's interesting because um, it looks pretty flat. There's that, right? We, we're looking at three seconds of sensor data. It looks reasonably flat. Maybe the nitrogen dioxide, I don't know if you can see it with, with your resolution, but it seems to be fluctuating just a bit. And now I'm going to do another sample, which is, um, and you will have to, to trust me with what I do with my, uh, my other hand. It's like right now the sensor is in the coffee can. What is going to happen? What do you think? Yeah, it's looking, it's not super strong. Uh, I wish I would have hoped for it to, let's see. Let's capture one more. But you you can kind of tell that not only the numbers are higher than before, uh, um, but it's also going up, right? We have, as soon as the sensor is hovering the, 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 the coffee, then uh, the, uh, the concentration of nitrogen dioxide and probably a bunch of other compounds is going up, right? We can see it. Uh, let's switch back to ambient. Ambient, we had about 350 ppm part per million of uh, nitrogen dioxide for coffee. It's a lot more. So there's information in there, right? Uh, and probably one thing that I already knew uh, back then is maybe I don't need AI, right? If it's just about telling coffee apart from uh, ambient air, it's just an if then else uh, kind of uh, thingy that I, I I can implement in my software. If uh, the amount of nitrogen dioxide is between 300 and 400, surely this is ambient air. If it's above 500, it is coffee. But then I started to smell a few other things. Uh, I started to smell rum, whiskey, vodka, things that, that looked really similar. At least my, my brain couldn't like, immediately pick up what could be the characteristics. I could have maybe spent some uh, uh, some time trying to figure that out by hand, 
but more likely, uh, this is where I started to need a, a neural network, right? And for for um, for designing the, um, the 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 tool chain, sort of, or the the the, the, the chain that would process my data, uh, there is like essentially a wizard in in the Edge Impulse Studio, and so I started clicking around, right? And uh, my input, the, the 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 red box on the left hand side, my input is what I had started to capture, and. Uh, the, what we still, what we see here is uh, hasn't changed much since I, I started. Like when I started, I was like, I think I need a couple seconds of data to capture just enough of the characteristics of a, um, a smell. Like it, it's going to fluctuate a bit. Um, like I probably don't need two minutes of data to, to capture this fluctuation. Let, let's see with, with two seconds, and then I, I played just a bit, but at the end of the day, 1.5 seconds is is plenty to just identify the, the, the data. And then uh, you should imagine like me starting uh, last year, my data processing pipeline was empty, right? I had the raw data, and then I, need, I needed to go all the way to the right-hand side, which is what's called the output features, the things that I wanted to identify, right? So how do you go from, from red to green? Well, you process the data, right? And at some point I knew, and I tried to, 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 to keep that uh, till the end, but I knew that I would need some kind of neural network, whatever that was. Um, but using the Edge Impulse Wizard, uh, I started clicking here, adding processing block. And then it's telling me things like if you're uh, interested in doing image stuff, you may want to pre-process the data a particular way. If it's audio, then you will need to run maybe FFTs or like things like that to extract some uh, frequency characteristics. You should run through an MFCC, et cetera, et cetera. But there's, there was also this idea of, uh, you know what, if your data is just slow moving averages like temperature data, gas sensor data, then just go that way, right? And so that, that, that's what I did, right? And so what, what is this guy doing essentially? We can have a quick look, but it's very aligned with, with, my, um, with the intuition that I had back then. It's essentially turning the raw sensor data that we see here. Uh, so it's like the, the 1.5 second of data sampled at 10 Hertz. It's doing what's called feature extraction. And it's as simple as computing the average, the minimum, the maximum, a few other uh, sort of statistical characteristics, things that are um, going to be really important, right? If, if you smell um, vodka and whiskey, chances are both are going to be equally strong or like closely, uh, like the, the amount of alcohol on average Will will be probably similar when 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 you when you read uh, and uh, the, the 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 sensor. But for vodka, I wouldn't be surprised if the slope, if you will, like once you just start smelling vodka, it goes through the roof way quicker than what it does with whiskey, right? And so that's something that you will capture if you compute the average, the standard deviation, etc. And so that's what the um, the signal processing block does. It turns the raw data into something more uh, more tangible, um, or at least more, uh, more meaningful, uh, in that like this is really those characteristics where it will make sense to try and um, dig into into them using machine learning to uh, to pick up whether there is information hidden in there, and that's the next step. And the next step is, and again, using the the, the Edge Impulse uh, Wizard, you just um, you're just like guided to be like, hey, you know what? You have computed some statistical uh, characteristics of your data. That's your input. Your output is one, two, three, four, five, whatever uh, smells, what you want to do is really just solve an equation of how does the input, uh, how is it correlated with the output? And so click, click, click in the in the environment and you start just like tinkering with uh, with some high level parameters, but then just like in, in a few clicks, you can train your uh, your model, right? And you can check uh, it, its accuracy. You can check how it, how, it, um, um, how yeah, what's the amount of uh, false positives that you may get and, and things like that. 
and um yeah one last thing here uh, one thing that i realized it, it took me a while but um when you do embedded machine learning uh like you might not tell here but um intentionally or not like either because the the overall framework is guiding me to do that or either because my target at the end of the day is a really small device um the model needs to be pretty small pretty optimized which means that sometimes like even if the accuracy is is really good um what the model that you're looking at here it smells what it smells ambient air coffee and whiskey what's going to happen when i'm going to smell rum with this particular model i wouldn't be surprised if the model would tell me hey you know what this is whiskey and is there a way to to work around that well there is at least there is a way to sort of uh, uh get a better indication of whether you should trust the results of your model or not and um it's through what's called anomaly detection i think we can have a quick look and visually i can hopefully make uh, make my point anomaly detection is essentially the taking all the smells that you've used for training all the different variations of ambient air coffee and whiskey that i've used and exposed my my sensor to and use again sort of very simple um sort of statistical um, um and, and some simple math to try and identify what is sort of the the space the smell space uh, if that word exists of uh, whiskey coffee and ambient and that's what you're looking at on the graph like this is uh like any data point um any um uh, amount of NO2 or whatever that doesn't belong to the blue area would be something that the model hasn't been trained on. So, what and I, may, I might have actually test data for that. Let's see. Um, actually, earlier today, uh, in preparation of the demo, I did smell uh, yeah, that guy, smoked paprika. So, I captured the um the smell of smoked paprika and i'm gonna make that part of my test set now if i go back to the anomaly detection i can like very visually sort of anticipate on what would happen if i were to like in real life smell paprika would that be something that falls out of uh it doesn't look like it does ethyl alcohol wise but let's see if there is a way to to show you yeah, so I guess this one would um, might not work. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm sure in in one axis or the other, smoked paprika would show up as not really belonging to to the things that you've trained the model on, and so you would have that information accessible when you like when you finally deploy your AI model on your embedded device, which by the way, is just one click away in the uh, in the user interface, right? You can just build a, a software library that you will use uh, and deploy back to your, uh, with your terminal or to your Arduino device. In this particular software package, you will have access to the, um, the anomaly, de the result of the anomaly detection algorithm. And you will be able to, to use that to um to see um to see what's going on and actually you know what we're gonna try uh, and see live what's going on let's see the um going back to my ip camera hopefully let's see yep so this is the device right now yeah, it's still stuck into the coffee um the coffee can so if i switch if i press the blue button let's see going to yeah i'm running the what's called the inference mode so right now oops apologies for the um yeah the, the glitch All right so it's confident a hundred percent that it is coffee now i'm going to remove the sensor from the coffee can and hopefully it should like slowly move back to telling me it is ambient air Let's see. I didn't expect it to be. Yeah, now, see, did you see the smiley face? Just like going, uh, it, it's starting to not be so sure because it's like, I just removed the sensor from the coffee can. So it's kind of in between 
uh, still picking up coffee and ambient it's not sure like the the smiley face might be uh, might be flickering a bit well now it's reasonably confident that it's ambient error and let's see if the anomaly detection works i actually didn't try um before let's see oh now it's whiskey that's weird uh let's see did i say paprika yes paprika that's a lot of paprika <laughs> let's see if at some point it's yeah so that's where you need more more training data and and better like fine tuning of the model so that's actually um an interesting discussion that that, that we can be, be having but i guess here my anomaly detection algorithm isn't um picky enough because it should i i i don't mind if my ai thinks it's ambient air because at the end of the day, a classifying uh, model is always going to try and give me a result. But thanks to the anomaly detection, it should be able to tell me, you know what, I just gave you a result because that's what I do. But uh, the input data that you gave me, it's nothing that I've seen during the training, right? So please take that with a grain of, of salt or a, or a dash of paprika, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, I guess that, that, awesome. that's for the tour of the... Um, um going from just raw sensor data to um like tinkering with the data to extract information that eventually i would feed into a model and just run very simple um and i figured out after, after the fact that the like the neural network is effectively a fully connected neural network with just like it's yeah i like to say it's just solving an equation i have um identified the average minimum maximum of the gases i want to correlate that with the smell of xyz what what is like what is the this this how do i solve this equation and then once i've solved the equation that's what i deploy back to my embedded device and and use for um for inference awesome that was a really really cool demonstration of the whole process thank you for that um I have, I mean, one, just one comment and then we'll go. There is actually a lot of questions in the chat, so we'll take those in a second. But I just wanted to make the comment, uh, you know, around exactly, you know, what you were talking about, the fact that you've got this anomaly detection block. I think that's super interesting, right? Because if you, if you build the application yourself, like at the end of the day and you deploy it on this embedded device, what you could actually do is, uh, and I don't know, I actually don't know how the application is built, whether it's, it's doing that already or not, but, um, uh, you know, in your case. But I think in general, you can... Make sure that if the if an anomaly is detected, you don't have to actually feed the the content or the the input to the yeah. to the neural network, right? So you can even save more power there. Yeah. And it's you know it, it's 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 actually a super quick uh, operation that you do in the in the front end of the of the of the whole process. Um, and, and it's super interesting, right? Because as you said, you can you can't train a neural network to recognize everything when it comes to embedded devices because you're trying to keep it small, right? So, so it's a good trade-off. Um, it's super, super interesting. Uh, okay, so let's take some questions. We've got quite a lot. I don't know if we can address them all, but maybe- Yeah, I think the first one that we should take yeah. is the most recent, but it's a good bridge into the AIoT side of things really quick since we have Paul on the call as well, so on the discussion as well. So being in the social media space, one of the things I did see come about right after this project um, was posted was, could it detect farts? So I know, you know, is it a real life fart detector? Can you smell to, you know, can you uh, smell to delta? It? But the thing is, there is a real use case there, right? Um, you know, think about it. If you were to install some sort of sensor in the bathroom, could you use, could you leverage the IoT to detect when you need to clean the, you know, the restroom or things like that? So, you know, something, all jokes aside, there is a real use case there, right? So this is twofold. So someone, someone is prepared. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. See? Perfect. So we weren't the only ones that thought that. So, you know, do you have plans to developing this project further? And, you know, what are some of the possible use cases down the road? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in a nutshell, making a device really smart is like, is now, I guess, pretty easy with tiny ML and the, the huge ecosystem of tools and hardware acceleration and whatnot. But uh, like, however smart your device is, if it's just like in the middle of nowhere, 
what do you make of the the information right like, and uh, things like i don't know a like it's it's a very tangible and very real use case you're um in the the business of like cleaning uh, office spaces if you send cleaning personal every week and turns out that it's covid and uh the uh the restrooms are, are not as busy these days are, are they are uh, typically sending someone every week is already too much like you're you're wasting uh time uh going somewhere to clean when it's not necessarily needed and so you may want to deploy some kind of smelling device in the in, in the building but then if the device is completely uh, of the grid or at least uh, not connected to to any form of uh, uh, internet connection then like how do you know that uh, you you need or or, or needn't go uh, service the, the the rooms and this is where you can start combining tiny ml with iot or ai with with iot and what some people would call aiot right and for a device like the one i picked for for my project uh it turns out that it has wi-fi right so you can uh, you can take uh, the nose on on one hand the uh internet i guess on the other and and an iot platform like azure iot or whatever uh, platform you, you you prefer and then you can on the embedded side of things in addition to running TensorFlow Lite and your AI model and whatnot, you can also like use your um, uh, SDK of choice for connecting to the IoT platform so that whenever there is something interesting that your AI model picked up, you can share it with, with the world or at least with your uh, in internet counterpart to, to begin with, right? And do things like sending telemetry, right? And so uh, sending the row sensor data maybe so that uh, you collect more and more uh, sensor data over time to uh, improve your, uh, your model. Or you can also send uh, things like, hey, I'm 85% confident that it smells bad in that room, right? Or uh, things like that. And it goes both ways. You can, whenever you want to deploy new uh, functionality to your device, you don't need to send a technician uh, there to just like take their USB cables or whatever to, to do uh, an update. You can do that over the air, which is particularly convenient in the context of tiny ML and, um, uh, and smart devices, because maybe you have over time, you improve your, um, your, your model, right? Something fart is one thing, uh, but an, another one that is actually uh, uh, making the, the news and making the rounds these days. And th there's more and more research uh, indicating that um, there are sensors that can pick up the smell of COVID-19 in the air. So that's a perfect example, right? You you ship um, a device that out of the box is sort of built and designed to recognize uh, and to tell uh, a nice smell apart from a bad smell. But six months down the road, you realize that with the sensor you have, um, you only need a better AI model or a different uh, AI model to also be able to pick up nice air, bad air, and COVID-19 um, uh, air, right? And so you can, over the, over, over the year, add functionality to your, to your devices. And it goes, um, so like, yeah, that, that, that's the device essentially connected to the Azure IoT platform. And so from there, you can see all, all the telemetry, you can set up some rules to, to, to send some alerts, uh, et cetera. And the alerts actually can be something really, really um, complex, not, not in the sense uh, complicated, but more like advanced in that take all your tiny devices that you've deployed in the field and think of them as entities that can come augment your information system. If I'm in the business of uh, cleaning office spaces, it's more than likely that in SAP or in my whatever like um, uh, environment I'm using to manage my, uh, my buildings, I've already modeled and described things like all the cities I operate in, uh, all the buildings um, I, um, I operate, what are the, f the different floors, the HVAC systems, the, the people uh, responsible for, for cleaning such and such floor uh, uh, with the, all the schedules, etc. And then you can add to this information system what's called the digital twin of your physical things. If you start deploying nose XYZ 
on floor three of a particular building in the city of, Chi of Chicago, once the device starts um, sending information, it's not just like a signal uh, that, that that doesn't mean uh, uh, much. It's actually a signal that you can correlate with the entities that are meaningful to you. And you can be like, hey, where is that nose today again? Oh, today it's deployed in floor three of this particular building. And who's responsible for cleaning this particular uh, floor of this particular building? Oh, it's John. Let's send John a text uh, and let's track that in our SAP system or whatever. And that's uh, that's where it starts making a, a, a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, so that's, um, I think that answers part of the the, the question that, that was in the chat as to um, developing the project further. For me, uh, that's really like trying to, to, to build on this idea of complementing uh, tiny ML uh, powered devices, like those low power super constrained devices, um, figuring out what's the best way, the smartest way to uh, to have them leverage the fact that once in a while, they might actually connect to the internet and to all sorts of um, um, environments that way. And I'm talking cool. a lot, you guys should interrupt me. Super cool, but but you know, I was gonna actually say, uh, this, is, this is perfect, right? Because, uh, I, I was doing IoT before before moving to TinyML, right, and and to embedded ML. And IoT is hard, right. And and I think you know when it comes to making sense of data, you really have to combine the kind of power of the single device with the power of of like aggregating all these different device data or device inputs, right? Like they could, you know, they're more smart than than a typical. Uh, kind of just device streaming all the data upstream, but still, it's it's a, a device uh, streaming some some sort of of uh, of, of uh, data to to uh, a central repository that then can kind of aggregate this uh, all this these the streamings and and actually make sense of of a much wider uh, problem, right? A much bigger problem. So I really I really like that use case, uh, the combination of the of the two things. Uh, Paul, do you want to do you want to add anything to to this discussion? Given that you you also profe a professional when it comes to IoT. I mean, the first thing I, I think when I see this stuff is is number one. I just think it's fantastic that when we can make sense of 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 our our own five senses. You know, when I look at computer vision, I think that's a huge thing. I look at you know voice assistants; those are huge. This is, in my opinion the next step, which is that smell. And I just think there's so many interesting things here. I know the question might have been thrown out there as a joke, but I, I think it's serious. You know, uh, when you have these these exhaust fans in restrooms, right, which I don't know about y'all, but people usually leave those things on when they don't need to be on, okay? So I think an AI fart fan built utilizing some of the sensor technology here that we've discussed today could not only be a game changer, but also the type of thing that can help your environment. And I think um, what I've seen here, just in the demonstration of the Edge Impulse's tooling for building those models, it looks like the AI stuff is targeted as being the next thing that's not gonna be hard. Uh, just just saying that. Like, I, I know I know you just mentioned, Alessandra, that, that IoT is hard. Remember that, that it was hard. It's gotten easier over time. And it just looks like this tooling just makes this stuff look like you can do the complex with, essentially something that can actually help guide you to get there make sure that what you're building is actually sound and then empower you to take that further so I, I, I again I think this is the harbinger of mainstream AI at the end of the day the smaller we make these models the bigger the problems we solve with those things and the more real time that we do it all of those are related to making these the things that change our lives great point and, and just just to kind of correct myself I meant, you know, IoT is hard when you do it yourself, right? Like you really need like platforms, uh, you know, like Azure to actually help you, right? Because if you try to do all that backend yourself, you just go mad, right? Like you, you're never going to come out of it. So, so honestly, you know, it's uh, we've gone a long way, right? I remember when when people were actually building stuff like that themselves. Uh, so yeah, so it's it's really cool to see uh, all the stuff that you guys have built and uh, you know the, all the services that you have uh, that you provide. So awesome, cool guys. Uh, I just. We're at the top of the hour, um, but I would like to take maybe two questions. Can we take two quick questions? Are you guys okay for that? From the of audience? Course. I just I just feel bad not to have taken a lot yeah, of Yeah, we had a few so. active uh, participants. I want to give them some, you know, some floor time. 
So I guess this one, uh, so Benjamin, how did you realize that you've collected enough data to make the nose perfect as I guess it would act different or different brands on different brands of coffee? Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. So there's that. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of sensor data to, um, to start getting good accuracy. Especially if it's about like telling uh, coffee apart from whiskey, like we briefly discussed, those are like pretty, pretty far apart anyways. Uh, but once you try and like identify maybe different kinds of whiskey, uh, like sometimes it works, sometimes it works slightly, um, um, uh, slightly less. And um, so, yeah, you don't need a lot of sensor data, but for making it really perfect, what would help is getting better sensors for one, because there's uh, like, uh, in many ways the sensor I used, uh, no offense to the Seed Studio folks, but it's, it's, it's meant to be cheap. So there are better ones, gas sensor wise, and or another uh, angle to make it more perfect would be to do what's called sensor fusion. If I want to tell um, uh, whiskey one apart from whiskey two, the smell is one thing, but what if I had, just like I mentioned before, a, a tiny, color sensor as part of the mix. And maybe one whiskey will be really, really brown and the other will be more yellowish. And this could be an input that I feed into the model, right? And, and I think just like our brain is probably perfect. <laughs> uh, I think if we get closer to how our brain works by adding more and more inputs uh, of what we uh, sort of even like emotionally um, consider uh, as being part of a smell, then you get closer to perfection. And the uh, uh, good news is it's easy to tinker with that. Like you can very easily plug new sensors to your, with your terminal or to whatever device you use. So, And since we're talking about, you know, perfection, uh, Girls into coding asks, what's the highest level of accuracy you were able to achieve with this project? Uh, it's like if it's always a, a matter of, of like a, a trade off of how many different smells uh, you, you want to classify. But uh, like when, and may, maybe that's where. Uh, uh, I, the project doesn't look as uh, useful as, as it uh, as it might sound, but smelling and telling white pepper apart from coffee, apart from whiskey, that's something that can be done with 100% accuracy because they are just so so different than uh, uh, that you can like literally have 100% accuracy. Uh, if you want something like more specific and you want to uh, classify 20 different spices, then once in a while there is like with, at least with the, the sensor that I'm using, there's just some information that I don't have access to because the, the sensor is not accurate enough. And there's always going to be this particular blind spot where uh, you cannot tell that spice apart from another because I would need to add to the mix, again, like I said, vision or an ammonia sensor or like something else. But uh, yeah, I hope that uh, answers the question. Perfect. So I think, uh, I think that's it for the questions. I think we were able to address most of them. So. Uh, Guys, thank you so much for this. This was fantastic. And again, this was my first live stream. So it was exciting to have, you know, you guys as guests and, you know, follow Alessandra's lead. I'm hoping we can make this more of a regular occurrence. Uh, so, you know, you'll hopefully you'll hear more from us in the foreseeable future. But until then, uh, Alessandra, I didn't know if you had any closing remarks, maybe around uh, Edge Impulse Imagine. One last uh, shout out. Yeah, I think everybody uh, remind. Uh, I just want to remind everyone to sign up to Edge Impulse Imagine. It's going to be a free three day event uh, where you can find everything about Embedded ML. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to check out this uh, this link, and uh, it will be down in the description as well. And uh, sign up and let us know if you've got any uh, interesting things to talk about. There is an option, an opportunity to um, to host a workshop. So let us know if you've got any cool workshops to, to host. And with that, I, I really, you know, I wanted to echo Artie. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Like this has been uh, an awesome live stream. Benjamin, I mean, you've done, you've done an awesome walkthrough and having Paul as well on the, on the show has been amazing. Uh, check out July OT, everyone. So I'll put up the banner again for that one. Uh, it's, uh, it's a week of uh, edge, uh, edge AI, and then it will be followed by, what's the last, what's the next week, Paul? Uh, students, makers, and um, educators. So that'll be the IoT for Beginners project will be a big focus on that week. 
And then the week of the July 19th, uh, as I had mentioned earlier in the stream, we're going to be posting a blog, uh, which we're really excited about. So definitely uh, check that out when it's live. And one thing we haven't actually um, shared is, uh, I mean, you probably all know, but Benjamin has been featured on, on Make Magazine. Uh, so check it out because it's, uh, it's really cool. I mean, you've also done a podcast with Make, right, Benjamin? Yep. Uh, and well, I, I'm happy with the session we did today, but that particular podcast, I really encourage you guys to, to listen to it because it's uh, yeah, it was a really great conversation with the uh, uh, the, the founder of Make Magazine on uh, on the tech behind the nose, but uh, but more than that. So yeah, ch check that out. And uh, also, the project is open source, right? So it's uh, I think it's in the description on YouTube. Everything is on GitHub. So like, try it out. Even the uh, the 3D enclosure, you can 3D print yourself um, if if you want. Um, check that out. Cool. And with that, I think we've uh, gone over by six minutes. Uh, so thank you all for, for watching today. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And as Artie said, stay tuned because we'll, uh, we'll have more coming. So until next time. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.